Thank you. So um, this is Joint Works, and Andam will give the meat of the presentation for sure. Let me see. If this doesn't show up on here. Okay. So um, as we're talking about the trade is vast, and it seems to get vaster by the day, in part because it's just the more we seem to learn, the, the worse things seem to get. So this was the first study published on the sea snake trade, for instance, out of the Gulf of Thailand into the Chinese market um, a couple years ago. And in some ways, I think that there are times we have to work on demand and supply, of course, but there may be times where we may choose to focus more on demand or more on supply, depending on how diffuse or concentrated those two things are. So uh, we're working really largely on the demand side or, or closer to the end user by looking at people buying um, wildlife online. And there's a tension because we know President Obama has made this great executive order and would like to reduce the trade in illegal wildlife. And at the same time, we have people wanting to <laughs> connect the world more and more. And this being the mission of, of course, private companies, but also governments and the idea that connection is going to uh, make the world a better place. Uh, that may not be true for everyone, um, especially if you're a pangolin, for instance. So um, this is just, you know, sort of saturation of internet users by country. Even though we have more internet users in China, for instance, there will be increasingly more and more. And what happens when these markets um, go online? What happens, this is a, actually a, a fisherman who was out catching one of those sea snakes. He's using a piece of rhino horn there as a piece of traditional medicine to combat um, the poison in the sea snake. So what happens when he um, has access to uh, online markets? So what we know about online markets to date has really been provided by civil society, which I think is interesting that academia has not been out in front on this issue. So the International Fund for Animal Welfare has done some of the uh, key work showing uh, through manual searches what's available in terms of the illegal online trade. They are focusing, as we are, on CITES Appendix 1 species. There are about 699 of them. These are species that have been agreed to at the CITES Convention to prohibit international trade in these species. And um, CITES Appendix 1 has been called a political listing rather than a scientific listing. But in any case, it's, uh, it's illegal. So it's a very good metric. So they looked over a six-week period at 11 countries in this first report published in 08, and then they just did another one in 2014 where they increased to 16 countries over a six-week period and found, uh, yeah, about 10,000 ads and 7,500 of those or so were Appendix 1 species. You can see the breakdown by species over here. And they're using teams of volunteers across these countries, coordinated by their central IFA office. Tanya McRae Steele is the head of, of uh, this project. Mm -hmm. When you said found these ads, when? Oh, sorry. Um, so they look at they've we looked at 280 online marketplaces, but websites like eBay, like Alibaba. Um, and country-specific sites like that. Now they're just moving into uh, social media, too, as a place to observe. But this, it's funny to me that it's being done, you know, again, not just by civil society, but manually as well, when you have the kind of computing power that you do in this room. So um, there have been some other attempts also to look at sort of CITES 1 trade online. This was a paper I think Lucas is familiar with that um, didn't exactly use any computational methods, but looked at 24 sellers on eBay. Um, they looked over a period of six months, twice weekly, at CITES 1 listed cacti. And then they compared what they found at the point where they reached 1,000 ads um, to the CITES permits that had been issued for those cacti. So you can trade in Appendix 1 species under exceptional circumstances, and same with Appendix 2. And they were able to show that a lot of this trade was indeed illegal because it didn't match up with the customs forms that had been um, achieved through CITES. And um, then there's a, a new paper out just this year on the dark web, which people are talking a lot about and its role in the wildlife trade. But this study looked at about 10,000 different items found on the dark web. And there was only a single instance of an illegal wildlife product, which was a hallucinogenic cactus. So this first sort of glimpse, at least in the, pu in the public record of, of the dark web, doesn't look promising for the illegal wildlife trade. And that may just be because the trade exists on the open web 
And it's um, quite obvious from the IFAW reports, for instance, that that's true. So we're interested in um, what kind of computa computational methods have been applied to the illegal wildlife trade. And um, the paper that, that most comes to mind, I think the only one we know about, is this one um, published in 2015, looking at uh, the, sh the Schreger lines on ivory and using machine learning to then detect uh, comp uh, through a, a photo algorithm, right, uh, ivory sales on eBay over an eight-week period. Now um, that eBay has cracked down so significantly on ivory sales, <laughs> these people apparently are uh, a little bummed out that their model has uh, been proven, you know, sort of obsolete so quickly. No, I'm sure they're thrilled. <laughs> I'm sure they're happy. Uh, they'll use it for other things. And there still is Ivory Online, of course. So then there's also a couple of, of computational projects that really, um, they kind of appear uh, in the same vein as ours, but are really quite different. This is GDELT. Uh, some of you may have read the paper um, by the the author behind this in foreign policy, and also this, uh, they really apply similar me methods as Health Map, which is using um, a kind of uh, machine to tool to aggregate news and website information from seizures of wildlife to map the trade. But this, um, in our minds, also highlights enforcement hotspots more so than the trade uh, per se, or may highlight enforcement hotspots hotspots rather than the trade. So this is really look, looking at what happens after governments and customs have already gotten involved. So it can give us a glimpse, but it can't tell us about like what is going on online right now. So we have two arms of our project. The first is academic in nature because there hasn't been a sort of large scale assessment of endangered wildlife online. So our first contribution is a paper that's just going to assess the critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable species and on the IUCN red list, tens of thousands of species, plus the CITES-1 species, where they're being sold on English-speaking uh, websites. And then the second project is a subset, sort of, of Project 1, which is to identify CITES-1 species, the definitely or probably or maybe even with a low probability um, illegal wildlife sales online. So Sanandan's going to talk about how you actually do that. Thanks. I'll hold this. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, for giving such a nice introduction to the project. Um, so yeah, I forgot to mention about the wildlife. So we're one of 16 finalists <laughs> for the Wildlife Crime Tech Challenge. To, um, and we're submitting our final application tomorrow, so wish us luck. Good luck. Yeah, Thank thanks. you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me start, uh, dive directly into the, the goals of the project. So uh, what we are trying to build here, the first uh, deliverable is uh, a customized search interface, which will create a vertical slice of the web, presenting results which are relevant to the wildlife related trade. The second is, Whenever we see any animal, any species in, in an ad, identify whether that species belongs to Appendix 1 or not, in other words, legal or, legal or illegal. So like uh, you see this ad, uh, is it like brown bear, which is listed in uh, CITES Appendix 1? And the third question is uh, identifying illegal product, not uh, related to wildlife, like this one being sold as bovine bone, is this ivory or not? So these are the three different uh, goals we have for this project. So the proposed solution will have like an automatic crawler which will, crawl, look, uh, will collect data automatically from the web and uh, it, anything detected will be reported in real time. And um, in, in this process it will also uh, identify potentially illegal um, items, illegal ads, or ads uh, dealing with illegal items and report those. And finally generate a report which like popular trends and uh, hot, hot spots and um, what are the, the items and uh, species more frequent than the others in this space. So uh, in order to do this, uh, we have targeted um, 70 uh, different sites, uh, English language sites, which includes online marketplaces, including social media, 
like individual retailer sites where uh, like marketplace is a, pl uh, a platform in the internet where buyers and sellers like interact with each other. In addition to that, we're also looking into sites where sellers are sell in the directly interacting with customers and selling stuff like taxidermy, online taxidermy store or online auction houses, etc. And uh, we got this list of sites based on a, a general web search uh, using keywords like wildlife for sale, it's, uh, like very generic keywords, and looked at the domain names of the most frequent um, sites which uh, were written by these queries. And we also looked at sites which are selling things, not like uh, Wikipedia or dictionary.com were also written. We ignored those kind of sites. So the keywords we use, there are basically two types of keywords on your right. Uh, this is the list of uh, um, species, uh, animal spe animals uh, listed in the Cytix, Cytis Appendix 1. And uh, in addition to the scientific name, we also are using common English, Spanish, and French names. And on the left-hand side, we are using some additional keywords, which are basically general wo words describing animals like snakes, birds, or like big cats. Uh, we are using uh, keywords related to body parts, which are being very frequently created, like skull, fur, uh, feathers and uh, like uh, popular products like trophy or like taxidermy and uh, the example I showed before like code was which we know about like ox bone or bovine bone which is used for ivory trade uh, oh, sorry um, so uh, uh, this data is all automatically collected. We have around like combining the species and the, uh, the additional keywords around more than 15,000 uh, 15, uh, keywords and we take one week to complete a cycle, collect all the data related to all the keywords and the sites um, in one round. So what are the features we can potentially use? One is the text. In ads, you don't have much text, but whatever text we have, we can, that can be useful. We look at the price. That can be a very good indicator of something being legal or illegal. We look at, uh, this is probably not uh, clearly visible, we look at the item location and where it can be shipped to. That, that, is, that will give us an indication whether the item is crossing an international border or not. And uh, also the uh, the delivery information, how fast it can be shipped. I'll come back to can come back to this later. Why this uh, is an important feature. Finally, the images. Um, like uh, images can have a, like uh, has uh, can potentially have a lot of information if uh, information can be extracted properly. So ne next, the data is clean. So whenever you search for wildlife related things in the internet, you get like T-shirts or soft toys which are not interesting to us. Uh, you get like. <laughs> Uh, the reason image can be very useful, like the text here is like uh, the, 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 uh, the third uh, image. The image says it all, that it's not a real um, like uh, head mount. Uh, also, we look into like the price because if it's too, uh, sometimes it's too cheap to be a, like an illegal product. And finally, we keep uh, the or the postings which has the potential of being illegal. So what are the challenges? It's not a very easy problem. First of all, the use, um, usage of um, key um, like um, uh, code words like uh, bovine wound in this case, or sometimes like uh, sellers use the words like replica or reproduction or faux, which are like maybe it's not fake. It's a real thing being advertised as fake. So um, the so sometimes the text can be mis misleading. We need to look, look into that. And uh, another problem we face is like the, taking the case of uh, zebra. There are three different species of zebra, and two of them are listed in uh, CITES 1, the third one is not. And whenever we see any zebra-related product, we see that it's the virtual zebra which is not in the CITES list. Always that uh, species name is mentioned. So we need to identify whether it's really virtual zebra or plain zebra or not, or it belongs to some the other endangered species. So, um, so what are the like the hints we can like? What are the cues we can get from these ads that can lead, help us to identify something is illegal or not? Uh, first of all, inconsistent inconsistent information. Like, look at these two different ads. Both are claiming that they have a CITES permit, and if you look carefully, it's the same permit. So sometimes we need to look into this kind of information, which is potentially inconsistent. That might raise suspicion. Second is incorrect information, like this ad. Uh, it says it's pre -citis. It's uh, it's a vintage uh, um, product, but is it so? It might be a, like a very recent product advertised as a vintage pre -citis product. And uh, finally, uh, looking into the um, the shipping information, whether it's crossing international border, and finally the shipping time. 
So this ad where I took this screenshot from was uh, done on uh, May, uh, March 31st, and it says that it can potentially ship this item within two, three days, which is too soon, and it's crossing uh, international border. It says it can be shipped from United States to many other countries. So it's too soon to get the CITES permit, So which makes it like, uh, uh, like you might think that um, it is potentially an illegal uh, product. So how can we collect all this and aggregate all this information to build a, uh, build a model to identify illegal ads? So the problem here basically becomes like a building this mapping function which will map an online ad or online posting into a variable Y, a binary variable Y, where zero will indicate it's illegal and one, it'll, one means it's, uh, uh, sorry, zero means legal and one means illegal. So this ad can be converted into a variety of features and some model parameters which will be taken as input and the output will be computed. So as I said before, the kind of uh, uh, features we used are price, text, shipping information, item location, and the images. And we can also like ask, uh, ask uh, experts to have, give us additional information, like people who work in ivory trade knows that just by looking at a photo of an ivory product, whether it's ivory or not. And we can just take those uh, cues to and be, uh, incorporate those into our model to identify specific products. And uh, so the first approach we tried combining these features is anomaly detection uh, to see whether like we can detect uh, outliers from this data. So look at this example. This is a price distribution of ads with the word bovine bone. We see that most of the uh, items uh, listed as bovine bone are priced less than $5,000. And this is in US dollars. And uh, the, um, sorry, uh, this is uh, the prices in US dollars. And the, uh, the y-axis represents the percentage. So most of the um, items are like less than $4,000, $5,000. But we see the certain um, items which are like far away from the, the, the no, stand uh, like uh, the mean uh, value of the prices. Uh, similarly, all the ads which had the words replica in it, so 90, more than 95 percent of the mass is below or close to thousand dollars. But there is like few items which are like exceptionally priced. So are these like an indication of uh, of uh, something being illegal, which is sold as replica, but it's not. So we try to generalize this, uh, this idea by combining the species names and the, the body parts or the product type. Like say, for example, ti combining tiger with tiger skull, tiger skin, tiger taxidermy, and uh, having this like a, uh, com uh, making a, doing a Cartesian products of species and the, uh, the item types, and uh, making like clusters of this and uh, plotting the, the price for each cluster. And we see, for majority of the clusters, um, the standard deviation is low, but for some cases we see like uh, outliers, like which like some items which are far away from the the standard range. So this uh, can be this uh, things can be taken as like uh, uh, illegal products. So we used a very simple um, uh, outlier detection algorithm, which is about like it's a graph-based method, where. Uh, um, for each item, you take like uh, uh, the close k closest neighbor, k nearest neighbor, and draw like directed edge. And if you find that some item has less than a threshold value of incoming edges, that means it's far away from uh, <coughs> far away from all the all other items. That means that's a potentially uh, a potential outlier. So based on this, uh, we uh, detect and. Uh, T, the threshold value is a user defined, which we used uh, to we try to learn from the data itself. Uh, we can identify outliers. Uh, we used another method, which is uh, called anchor variable, uh, which is like uh, which has been used in uh, classifying like clinical uh, uh, predicting clinical states from uh, uh, medical records. So this the nice thing about this method is it works for when you have data with very noisy labels, no labels, or only positively labeled uh, data. And how this works is like you try to find, so if your data has two types of variables, one is uh, observable and others are latent, you can't observe the values. So only by looking at the observed, observ observed variables, you can try to find out, um, like uh, try, uh, find out one particular observed variables which has a very strong link to the latent variable. So in that case, those, this particular variable is called the anchor variable. You can replace the 
you can use this observed anchor variable as a noisy label and try to predict that. So you don't have to worry uh, worry about the uh, worry about the, the latent variable at all. So how this works is like uh, so the idea is you have to find cases where um, the observed variable, the anchor variable, and the observed variable has like the same value. If the anchor variable is one, the observed, uh, the latent variable is also one with a probability of one. Like uh, Um, sorry, I, I forgot to put that in the in the slide. So basically, uh, you have to find that like uh, if uh, the probability of y equal, uh, y equal to one given a equal to one should be one. In that case, you can replace the uh, the uh, the um, latent variable with the observed variable and redefine the the prediction problem. This is like I've explained this using like binary. Uh, variables, but it can be easily extended to like uh, continuous variables. So how we can use this idea into our method is like we can use price or certain code words as the anchor variables, which we can see in the ad. We don't know whether it's legal or illegal, and try to implement uh, uh, this uh, way of classifying the ads based on what we see. And um, so, and we can use apart from price or the code words as anchor variables. We can also ask for very specific products or species experts what can be a good anchor variable, which is very has a very high information content to predict something. And uh, so, this is what we have done so far. So, the next steps are so we have like, looked at into like very specific features of the ads or the online uh, postings. Uh, but uh, we know now, at this point, we would like to look into images. So we would like to like get information from the images, which can give us valuable information. Also, we are like we are into like identifying. The, we are also trying to understand the scale of uh, illegal wildlife trade uh, in the internet. And for that, we need to do some kind of uh, duplication, uh, duplicate detection. Like you see, this this same product has been advertised in two different sites. So image processing, like image matching, can uh, very easily help us to identify these kind of duplicates. And uh, so far, we have concentrated only in English language. So we would like to extend this work into other languages, like Russian, Chinese, or certain South, uh, Southeast Asian languages. And uh, we are, our methods are giving us some um, estimation of whether an ad or an online posting is legal or illegal, but we need to validate those results. So for that, we need to engage uh, like experts or people who are in this work in this space to help us with that. Um, so before concluding, I would like to thank uh, the Moore Sloan Data Science Environment at NYU to, for sponsoring this, uh, supporting this project, and all our partners from uh, uh, MSR, uh, like Lucas is here, who has, help, who has helped us a lot. Um, IFO, uh, University of Washington, and uh, U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife Services. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll end my talk. Okay. <laughs> Time for questions. So is the goal here to build a fully automated system, or is it something where you raise alerts for human experts to look at it later? A mix of both. Um, so the tool's purpose is to give some kind of probability value to an ad, being illegal or, illegal or not. And then the human expert can use that value and use his or her own judgment to take a final decision. And um, yeah. We think though that some retailers may want to use it in advance of even posting the ads as like to supplement their own efforts, some of which are next to nothing, so that they can screen out ads before they even post them. So isn't this a continuously moving target problem? For example, if you try to crack down on this problem with a certain set of keywords and people see that you're identifying their ads as illegal, they would change their, start changing their keywords. And so how would you continuously keep identifying or knowing what are all the keywords that uh, correspond to illegal items. Or maybe <coughs> when you are trying to crack down on the normal web right now, they may also move to the dark web, for example. So if the dark web thing happens, I, we would say that's a success of our project, first of all. And second is like that, the, the previous question you had. <coughs> um, like we yet 
uh, we don't have a method to identify code words. We are using what the code words we already know. People who have researched in this area already know. So we also, it's part of the problem, part of the project to identify uh, code words. If that's, that one is done properly, uh, this moving target thing wouldn't, shouldn't be a problem. We, should, we should be able to identify new um, code words. And if it moves to dark web, um, that's bad. And it will like, require a completely different approach to identify those items. It speaks to where we prioritize wildlife, that it is on the open web, though, because, of course, human trafficking is not. And it's so rampant in the open web. Like At this point, this is the, the issue we need to tackle. which were the NGOs like IFA, we thought might be sort of clients of the data, and then um, retailers like eBay, and then enforcement like Fish and Wildlife. And those are still our three, and we have they move around in our minds as to who is the, of the highest priority or who we should tailor the, um, the tool for. So I think those are the three we're thinking of at the moment, and we are in conversation with all of them. So it's a question in the end though, of who we think will, will use it most. Um, and, and where it would make the biggest difference for wildlife. You mentioned collectors, right? Like the, the individual collectors. Yeah. That's no, also a possibility. Like individual collectors, like if I want buying something, like I'm a good person. Also, I need to, I need to have this information whether what I'm buying is legal or not. That's also a possible use case. But, the more, I mean, but not I, sharing the data. Yeah, of course not. Yeah, I guess the, the, that brings up the question that if this is made open to the public, then the bad guys might, might use it to figure out what you are thinking about it, right? so you may... Yeah, like, we need to, like, figure out those things, uh, like, once this is ready. I guess also, like, making it a sort of publicly available tool opens the <coughs> door for vigilante justice type reactions, which, I mean, I know we're all pro-wildlife here, but at some level, like, this should be a law enforcement issue and not vigilante groups going out and punishing, like, this little line hunter or whatever. So the, these companies have trusted flagger programs already. Um, so eBay, Craigslist doesn't because Craigslist doesn't care. But you know, uh, <laughs> not every company does. But most of these companies have trusted flagger programs, and this that's a fantastic intersection for the companies to maybe not do it themselves, but to make this tool available to the public, but which is kind of a sub-select group of the public. And, and to be clear, I mean, you know, we can say things should, should be law enforcement issues or not, but, you know, they're, they're generally being taken care of in the hands of private corporations which choose to or to not or not to post particular ads. And there's only very specific um, domains where private corporations and public law enforcement agencies have really partnered together on strong data sharing, and that's principally around child pornography and human trafficking. So. All right, well, we're going to move on to our final talk, so thank you. Yeah.